I think it's important for people to realize that, especially the youth, that even if the cards that life deals you doesn't always come out in your favor for you to pursue your dreams from the start, it's important to always dream. I am Sabrina Thompson. I work at NASA, and this is my story. I was raised in a community that was, uh, it was considered the poorest community on Long Island in New York. And I remember trying to figure out what I wanted to go to college for, what, what did I want to study. One teacher told me, how about you try mechanical engineering, you're very creative and you know, you're, you're smart, you're good in math and science. And I remember asking my physics teacher about it and he said no, he said you, you know, those classes are gonna be so hard for you. You should stick with what you're good at, which at the time for me was art. And that's kind of what started me on this path, actually, to pursue a, a career in engineering. So I say all that to say that you should never let some someone take away your dreams or hinder your dream. Working at NASA, that, that was a big accomplishment for me. I'm the first in my family, actually, to receive a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, and in the future, hopefully, a PhD as well. NASA is a place where there's a lot of great opportunities for people who love learning. I'm one of those people, I love to learn, and I know that if I had a job that uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't continue my learning, that would, that would hinder me in some way. And so I think that was one thing that really attracted me to NASA, just the opportunities to learn. We're making innovative things here, and, and, and so for me, that's, that's very important. I'm contributing to the betterment of society, so that's definitely important for me, and NASA is definitely a place where you can do that. I think my future is very bright. I see myself actually working on space flight, hardware, getting into the lines of actually u utilizing my skills as an aerospace and mechanical engineer. Depending on you know how things turn over in the future, I actually see myself becoming an astronaut, and especially a, a motivational speaker. I love talking with kids. I love inspiring people, motivating people, just to get the energy inside of them that exists and, and use it for you know their betterment, for the betterment of society. It hurts me to see people accepting. Um, how I'm gonna say this word wrong? Mediocrity. Mediocrity. Yeah. <laughs>
So I am so proud of our website that we're rolling out today. And we're highlighting all of these wonderful women. And we have several of the women who are highlighted on our website here with us in the audience today. Can you please stand if you are one of our women at NASA uh, website participants? You see how many joined us today. Thank you. You know, NASA's vision is to reach for new heights and to reveal the unknown so that what we do and what we learn will benefit all humankind. These women on this website, many of whom you just saw standing, are doing just these things on a daily basis. So how did this website come about? The White House Council for Women and Girls has members from across the federal government and our agencies all contribute our efforts to focus on enhancing opportunities and removing barriers for women and girls. One of the priority areas for the Council is increasing the number of women in science, technology, and engineering fields. NASA is in a unique position to inspire girls and women to enter into these fields through its incredible mission. So we thought, what better way to inspire women and girls than to share some of the fascinating stories of women here at NASA and how they got to NASA through our website. We could have provided links and lines of information to different resources for women and girls, but what's more inspiring than seeing the women themselves and hearing their stories? And so that's what we did. We have a wonderful web designer who's also our manager of our open, open government initiative, Nick Skitland, who designed our website for us, who's here in the audience with us today. He did an incredible job. And please go to the website. Thank you, Nick. Please go to the website starting today. Come back often. We're going to have a lot of updates. It's women.nasa.gov. You can get there through our homepage, nasa.gov. It's fabulous. You'll love it. Um, and now I have the honor to introduce NASA Deputy Administrator Lori Garver. Talk about inspirational. Imagine being second in command of an agency of more than 18,000 civil servants and more than 40,000 contractors. Imagine in just one day having to explain to Congress why we need the multi-billion dollar James Webb Space Telescope, then turn around an hour later and have a meeting with the White House on, uh, with senior White House officials, I should say, on information technology, and then have a media interview about NASA's proposed budget. And that's on a light day. Uh, Lori is amazing, and she does her job with intelligence, candor, and humor. Please help me welcome NASA Deputy Administrator Lori Garver. Thank you very much, Rebecca, uh, we, uh, and uh, Sabrina. It's a really real pleasure to be able to say welcome, ladies, to NASA. I don't get to do that uh, often enough. Really, really great to see uh, you all here and to share with you. Uh, our stories. As Rebecca has talked about, we are unveiling this website, the Women of NASA today. We are so proud of the contributions of uh, all women to, uh, the, that we are highlighting to NASA, and we hope to even expand beyond the 32, some of which uh, stood uh, already. I do believe that we're going to tee up one minute of my, of the four minutes, I just said it is, it is too long, uh, on my profile on this video, so we could roll that now. There are so many happy moments of my career. When President Obama asked me to come back, there was no question that I was just thrilled to do anything here uh, that he felt uh, I could help him do at NASA. So of course, that's something that is uh, pretty daunting to come to NASA to serve the president as the deputy administrator of an incredible agency. Going through the whole process of confirmation with Charlie, uh, Bolden was an incredibly wonderful experience. There have been so many highlights for me. The moment of liftoff of the last space shuttle mission 
where I was with the head of the Russian Space Agency and on the balcony of OSB2, we're standing there three and a half miles away. And to think that the very organizations that symbolize the Cold War were now working together. And as the rocket lifted off, it was an incredible moment. So again, please go to the website and uh, listen and watch as uh, you outline, we outline in this website for you the backgrounds and experiences of, of those of us who work at NASA. This is really all about you today. This is about you students uh, and uh, the first LEGO League robotics teams, all female teams we've got here, as well as representatives from schools. Uh, around the city. Uh, I uniquely, unfortunately, of course, as uh, so ironic, only have boys. Uh, my have teenage boys, and uh, so it is especially wonderful to uh, welcome you. Rebecca has her daughter uh, down here, just I think to continue to make me jealous that she uh, ha has someone, Sammy, to buy uh, pink for. March <laughs> is Women's History Month, and the White House Council on Women and Girls uh, is co-sponsoring this event with us today at NASA has identified education and employment as the two themes to focus on this month. So the people you'll see here today are prime examples of what you can achieve if uh, you pursue uh, science and technology, engineering, and math education. STEM education is something that we care a lot about at NASA. We are the largest federal employers of people in the STEM fields. Uh, while there are a lot of career paths that are, uh, of course, going to make you all productive members of society, uh, we in particular believe that women going into the STEM fields is something that uh, we at NASA want to promote. Women have, over the years, made huge contributions to NASA. We've been astronauts, scientists, engineers, program managers, and yes, bureaucrats like me. Uh, a woman wrote NASA's founding documents in 1958, uh, Eileen Galloway. She only died a few years ago at 105, and it was a privilege to know her. She worked for Lyndon Johnson in the United States Senate and wrote the Space Act of 1958. A woman founded NASA. I know a lot of people believe it was Eisenhower, but I'm giving it to Eileen Galloway. Uh, it was a woman who very recently, uh, uh, she was funded by NASA Research Money, but she uh, found this unique life form on Earth, maybe you heard of it, based on arsenic rather than carbon. And she is only 33 years old. Uh, but as I said, we need more. We have about 6,000 women at NASA. Here's the statistics part. We love our statistics at NASA. We have 18,000 civil servant employees, as Rebecca outlined. 6,600 are women. Uh, 2,500 are engineers, and that's out of a, uh, or in technical fields, and that's out of about uh, 9,000 engineers um, and uh, our, our general employment. So let's talk about that for a minute. How, how, do, how do you guys feel about that? Are, are women a third, a quarter of, of uh, the population? No. What are we? We're actually a little more than half, right? Because we live longer. Uh, so <laughs> we do uh, have a ways to go. I think, I, I know for myself, I owe so much to the generation that came before me. They literally opened the doors to allow me to have the opportunities that I have. Uh, but that just makes me more committed every day to do the same for you. We love to be proud of our uh, female astronauts, one of whom I'm going to be able to introduce in a moment. We love to be proud of our, our CFO is a woman, our CIO is a woman, one of our 10 uh, center directors is a woman, none of our mission directors are women, our deputy is a woman, I'm even the second woman deputy at NASA. Um, okay, it's progress. Uh, but let's not, let's, let's not stop trying to reach uh, for, for full equality. Um, I can see your generation is going to change that. Your generation, no one's going to mention, if you're the deputy, that uh, in particular uh, you're, you're a woman. So this is uh, a commitment that, that I make to this, and it's one of the reasons I'm so happy that NASA is partnering uh, with the White House Council on Women and Girls and uh, doing this website. 
So the White House also just issued a report called Women in America. It summarizes the status of women, women generally in many areas, including careers and education and health, where we've made a lot, a lot of advancements. Uh, it's the first time this report has been done since 1963. I think people thought maybe we were done. Are we done? Not so much. Uh, as the report notes, we do still have a long way to go, but women are out making uh, many, many strides in the workplace and, of course, in, in education. I have to acknowledge having one of my uh, boys just go through the college application process. You know, he can have lower scores and get in because women, in general, have higher scores and they need a few boys just to go to college these days to, to meet with you guys. So, see, I know. Uh, as Rebecca mentioned, we have a host of female NASA innovators and trailblazers with us uh, that stood. And they continue to inspire me every day. And for those of you who are students today, you know you are the key to our future. So please uh, get a hold of, of these women after the program. Talk to them about the uh, careers that are possible to you if you go into any of the, the science, technology, engineering, and math careers. You truly, truly are our hopes and dreams. And we at NASA hope we get a share of you as you enter these careers. So again, thank you for being here. It is now my privilege uh, to introduce uh, the partners that NASA has in today's program, as I mentioned, uh, the White House Council for Women and Girls. And the chair of that council is Ms. Valerie Jarrett. She is the senior advisor to the President of the United States of America. Just thought I'd add that. It's not just any old president. Uh, assistant to the President of the United States of America for Intergovernmental Affairs and Public Engagement. Now, uh, Ms. Jarrett was also the co-chair of the transition team for the Obama administration. And this was where I first got to meet this amazing person as one of the true uh, highlights and honors of my life and career has been to lead the transition team for the uh, incoming Obama administration at NASA. So we spend a couple months, think about now your, your, public, your uh, political science part of, of your studies. When the election happens in the United States, we transition to the new administration in such an efficient and effective way. As we look around what is happening in the world today, you really recognize the responsibility of that two and a half month period where you're learning what you can about what is happening in the government and being ready on the moment at uh, 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 noon of January 20th of that new year to become uh, the leaders of uh, the administration part of the government. So Valerie Jarrett co-led what has widely been uh, reported as the most effective transition uh, for government in our entire history. And it was a privilege to work with her there. It is a privilege to co-chair this event on women and girls. Please help me welcome Valerie Jarrett. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, how are you guys doing? You look great. Lori, thank you for that introduction. We had a terrific time during the transition, and Lori doesn't know how cool I really think this all is. So for me to be over here with you today, I am just delighted. Uh, the president asked me to come over, and I said, are you kidding? I'm rushing over there to meet all these terrific young women and girls and academics and folks here at NASA. What a terrific, terrific opportunity it is for me to be. You guys look really good. <laughs> I heard about you all, right? And I love your outfits. So, um, so let me tell you this. I think the fact that we can try to get young people interested in science and technology and engineering and math is exactly where we should put our focus right now. And the president has made it a priority. I, um, I think about the women astronaut Sally Ride or me. May Jamison, who I have to tell you guys, I went to college with. We lived in the same dorm. And although I wouldn't have necessarily predicted that she would be an astronaut, I knew that May had the gift and determination and tenacity to do whatever she put her mind to doing. And so even though it's been just a few years ago since we were in college together, you can laugh. It's funny. I know. It's not like it was a few years ago. It was like 30 years ago. But um, I saw in her a spark and a passion. 
and it's really what has fueled her all these years. And I'm hoping, and I can just tell by the looks of many of your faces, that you guys have that passion too. So the president has been focused like a laser beam on getting young folks involved in science and technology and engineering and math. And I want to just talk to you a little bit about what we're doing at the White House. So in 2009, the president set a very ambitious goal. He wanted to move the US students to the top in math and science over the next decade. And so in his State of the Union this year, the president called for the nation uh, to have an effort to get 100,000 new teachers in science and technology and engineering and math. So you'll have plenty of people out there ready to teach and engaged and dedicated to this very important field. And as we focus on education, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to support uh, going into these important fields. And so that's why in the president's education initiative called Race to the Top, he invested $4 billion specifically targeting women and girls and getting them interested in these fields. And so I want you to know you are on his mind. Uh, it's also why he launched a new initiative called Educate to Innovate. And this is a campaign that's a public-private partnership geared towards focusing on math and science. And another one called Change the Equation, where we now have over 100 companies who are working with us to design curriculum and to mentor young girls and to get you guys all excited and knowing that if you pursue these careers, when you finish your education, there's going to be just a terrific job waiting for you at the end of it. And to any of the employers who are watching out there, we want to make sure that everyone gets engaged in this. Sometimes when you just walk in the door and you visit a potential employer, you see what they're doing, just like hopefully coming here today, provides you with just a little inkling into what the possibilities would be. And we want to make sure that we engage the private sector in that. The federal workforce is getting involved as well. We have over 200,000 federal scientists and engineers who are working in their local schools and communities and they're mentoring and provide, providing an experience in hands-on science to more and more students. At the White House, um, at, I chair the White House Council on Women and Girls, and our goal is to look across the federal government at all the agencies, and that's why we have NASA as a partner and we have every federal agency as a partner, and our mission is simple. What can we do to improve the quality of life in the United States for women and for girls? Because we want to celebrate you and all of your terrific accomplishments, and we want to support you in every way we can. And everything from at the, uh, the State of the Union this year, when the president was focusing on science and technology and engineering and math, the First Lady had some young uh, girls in the box who were interested in the field. We had a science fair uh, at the White House. We had astronomy night at the White House. We have an Easter egg roll, which most of you are too old for at the White House, but we're going to focus on science there this year because we want to get people interested when they're young and we want to be able to help you so that the next time we come back in this auditorium is 10 times the size full of terrific young people interested in this field. I also want to um, ask you a few questions just to give you things to think about. First one is, how can NASA do unique things to get young people interested in science. Obviously today is one step in the right direction, but those of you who, who are here are already interested. So what can NASA do to help get you interested? Well, let me throw out just a few ideas that we have, and then you all will have some ideas too, and I see you guys giggling in the back. Uh, there is a current move growing uh, to say for students who are seriously interested in spa space exploration, and they call it uh, DIY space, do-it-yourself space, just like, you know, do-it-yourself house repairs. And these folks are building small satellite phones that you can put into orbit. Even uh, in our high schools, they're trying to build these mini satellites, something that's never been done before. Or imagine if you could put the tools of invention right in the hands of all children so that they could just hit a print button and they could design computers that, that would print out in 3D whatever they came up with. That'd be pretty cool, I think. Or imagine if you could get an achievement badge in space exploration, just like the Girl Scouts get their badges. Or a black belt in karate. When you practice harder, you go to the next level. Imagine if NASA, with game designers, um, helped you create space explorers. And you could have badges, and you could start on your path to becoming an astronaut right now. These are just a few of the many examples that we want to engage with you and get you excited and get you thinking about. And um, I guess I would close by just saying this to you. You all are so incredibly special. You're just so gifted and you're so talented. And we are all pulling for you. And what we want you to do is pull for yourself. Challenge yourself. 
see what you can do to push yourself just that little bit further and know that from the President on, of the United States to NASA to all of your incredible teachers, everybody here is here really just to support you in your efforts. And we wish you the absolute very best. Congratulations to you all. Here comes something big. <laughs> well, you know NASA. We don't do things in small way. Yeah, if you I go could, large, go Tracy, large. come up. First, I just want to I, I, thank you so much for coming. I uh, have to uh, just let you know that a number of the events you talked about, certainly the Astronomy Night and the uh, she, President Obama had the science fair winners, and I, of course, always focus, as I was telling you, on the young women. But I was allowed to bring my boys, I only have boys, to astronomy night on the White House lawn. Uh, but of course, the poor things, uh, we highlighted the woman that night, she's, she was a girl, I think she's 11, who uh, discovered a uh, supernova. And uh, so the boys come home, do your homework. You haven't discovered anything. You're 16 and 18 years old. So sometimes it's a, it's, it's a, little, a little hard to live in my house. But uh, we really want to thank uh, Valerie Jarrett for her support uh, of the women at uh, NASA website. We could not have done this without the White House leadership of, of the council. And so we have, of course, NASA does not do things in small ways. And Tracy's going to help me present this because she's actually got pins on it. Valerie, this is a montage that women have been on every mission that is represented oh here at NASA. And oh our gosh. citation reads, in recognition of your outstanding leadership in inspiring and preparing young women to become future scientists, engineers, leaders and innovators. This montage contains the pins of space shuttle and international space station crews that included NASA female astronauts who were key contributors to the nation's human spaceflight program. This so is like this a little thing. Gift I've gotten in ages. Thank you guys so much. I think there's someone who's going to take someone it for you here. Us. Yes. Thank you guys. Have a great day. Enjoy your time here. Thank you for coming. This way? Okay. Thank you, thank you again. Uh, you, you can sit down because I think we'll play your video first. But thank you, thank you again. Our, our uh, next and final speaker is, as I'm sure you've all been waiting for, uh, our, our astronaut who is here from outer space to talk to us. Uh, Tracy Caldwell Dyson is a chemist. She is a NASA astronaut. She is one of 53 women to travel to space out of some <coughs> 500 people who have been in orbit. Again, we're still working on that. Tracy was a mission specialist on the space shuttle Endeavor. That mission uh, took place in August of 2007. If you guys are paying much attention, which hopefully you are, Endeavor is on the launch pad right now for uh, liftoff in April. On that mission, she operated Endeavor's robotic arm and served as a crew member inside the station directing, directing for spacewalks. And she flew more than five million miles in space just on that mission alone. And that was a short uh, mission, probably about 12 or 13 days. But last year, she launched aboard a Russian Soyuz capsule to the space station, the International Space Station. She went on to live aboard the station for nearly six months. And it doesn't say how many million miles, because uh, I, I'm sure she knows. She completed, at that time, then three of her own spacewalks uh, to do repairs on the International Space Station. When she and three of her colleagues joined uh, with the space shuttle docking, they did make history with four women in space at once, the first time we've had uh, four women in space at one time. She says she wanted to be an astronaut for many years, but let's watch and listen to her story in her own words as seen on our website, Tracy Caldwell Dyson. The greatest barrier I've had to overcome in my career. That's the scariest thing that I've ever looked at, and that's my confidence. Yeah. I'm not completely void of it. Um, but uh, what when I look back on the moments that I've struggled the most, it's been where I've let my confidence droop. 
what I had going for me is I'm a hard worker. You tell me I can't do something, I'm gonna prove to you that I can. Determination, that, that, that uh, pays a lot of the bill and, um, and really helps you overcome fears for, uh, for at least uh, a number of people I know. What did I want to be when I grew up? Well, I think like all kids, when you uh, look up in the stars and you see the infinity of space, you think you want to be an astronaut. Uh, but then also you got pets and you want to become a veterinarian and you see uh, heroes like firemen come out and save the day, you want to be one of those two. But uh, it probably wasn't until I was about 16 years old when I got really uh, serious about what I wanted to be. And it was a uh, little bit of research. I discovered I wanted to become an astronaut. You know, when I was a kid in high school, I was really fascinated by science. I was fascinated, I, to say I was fascinated, really, honestly. There were these questions out there like, why is the sky blue? Why does water boil? And I, I was a kid with just a lot of questions and no answers. And uh, was that curiosity that I was, it was satiated, was, was quenched by science, and namely chemistry. I think that's why I gravitated towards chemistry, because it, went, it answered the questions that I had uh, my whole life. I uh, focused on an area of chemistry that really fascinated me. It had nothing really to do with uh, space or being an astronaut, but it was something that really motivated me and uh, turned out to be pretty successful at it. And I think that's 100% because I really enjoyed it. I had some struggles in college with math, and uh, those really were a roadblock to succeeding in chemistry. I understood chemistry fine. I mean, I. I could picture molecules and electrons zooming around a nucleus and all that kind of good stuff. But I, in order to keep going further in chemistry, which was my passion, I had to prove a, a level of competency in math that I just wasn't comfortable with. And why didn't I feel comfortable with math? Because math was this abstract thing that um, was something you did on paper, but it, it did, just didn't have any application in the outside world, according to Tracy Caldwell. And uh, what, what, what started to make a difference to me in math and why I thought I could conquer it was the day that I, I was learning a topic in, in math, in calculus, and it made no sense to me. It was an abstract thing. And then in that same semester, I was taking a class in chemistry, in physical chemistry, and there's actually math, believe it or not, that describes the motion of an electron around the nucleus of an atom. Go figure. I didn't, I, I wasn't even prepared for that. But it got my attention, why? Because I loved chemistry. And, and here was chemistry using math to help me understand chemistry better. So what I learned from that was that, you know, that, that math did have an application, it was chemistry. And, and I could get really excited about something that scares me if I can appreciate I make a connection to it, to something that I really enjoy. Um, and it, uh, overcoming that, that, that fear of math, knowing that, knowing that, yes, indeed, I can understand math. I've got to humble myself and ask questions. I've got to uh, work hard and do extra problems, uh, you know, when I don't feel like it or I'm scared. And I just got to go for it because it's, if it's an obstacle to get to what I want, it's going to still be there. Uh, whether want it to be or not and it's amazing how much you can grow when you decide you're just going to conquer that thing and not let that thing conquer you so I'm really glad that I got over math. If I had to give some advice just based on, on my own life and, and uh, what put me on the right path, that's to know yourself. Uh, you know you, you've heard people say dream big or follow your heart but know yourself. It, and, and put some stock in the things that you enjoy doing. Because it's, it's when you enjoy what you're doing that it's gonna bring out the best in you. And that's what we want, that's what you want. I'm Tracy Caldwell Dyson and I work at the NASA Johnson Space Center. Thank you very much, and Lori, thank you for that introduction and a bit of a history on 
what I've done at NASA since I got here. Um, it is, uh, one second, I got so many pockets on this thing. It is so cool, but that's how you carry your water. Um, it really is a privilege for me to be here today. Women's History Month, women at NASA, science cheerleaders, and all the inspiring women of the, or the inspiring stories of the featured women and the untold stories of so many others. I'm just grateful for good timing, actually. I happen to be the only female astronaut in town uh, that just returned from a, a life in space. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing the hoops you have to go through to uh, get an invitation to such an event. But it's, uh, no, really, it really is uh, an honor to be here. Um, and I do feel honored standing before not only this audience, but amongst these incredible women. They're insightful, insightful and inspiring, whose tenacity, courage, intelligence, and strong character is as lifelike and, and tangible on screen as I'm certain they are in person. These women have my respect, and at the very least, they should have your full attention when you watch those videos. I've, I've watched them, and if you're anything like me, you'll catch yourself smiling with probably a tear in your eye as you are absorbed in their stories. I know that you'll be inspired with them, uh, and uh, you'll embrace their messages, I hope, and through them, convince yourself that you too have what it takes to be a success just like them. So you guys remember that those hoops I was telling you I had to go through to, to get here? to get invited to one of these things? Yeah, I had to go into space and live there for six months. <laughs> so I brought with me just a few slides just to uh, kind of recap uh, what life was like up there and give you guys a little taste for what it's like to live in microgravity on board the most incredible, magnificent vehicle ever built by our entire planet, and that's the International Space Station. That's me and my crew that, uh, and our backups. That's us getting ready for launch, my commander, Sasha Skortsov. These are going to go pretty fast, so I'm going to try to be brief with what I say. There's us on the launch pad getting ready to get into our uh, Soyuz rocket. And there's a photo of me sitting in my seat. That's us launching. That's our vehicle uh, in the two days that it took us to get to the space station, and that's what that beautiful vehicle looks like. That's us just about before we dock. And those are the, that's the crew, that's all of us on the Earth, uh, that's all of us in space. <laughs> Oleg Kotov, TJ Kramer, and Suichi Noguchi were the three that were on board when we arrived. And two days after I arrived, a space shuttle launched, space, space shuttle uh, Discovery with STS-131. And they had a number of spacewalks. I helped uh, prepare those guys to get out the airlock. Just a few shots of what it's like to be a spacewalker outside doing an EVA, we call it extravehicular activity. And there's Discovery there in our empty payload bay with the two little spacewalkers inside. There's uh, all of us inside Node 1 enjoying a meal, and that just gives you a feel for uh, how everybody hangs out. <laughs> That's Suichi there and myself. There's the four ladies, as Lori mentioned. Uh, first time four ladies were in space together. And actually, Shannon Walker and myself were the first two uh, uh, females to live on board together on the International Space Station. Atlantis, uh, I'm sorry, Discovery went home, and then Atlantis came shortly after they did. There's the crew. There's the two of my classmates, T.J. Creamer and Ken Ham. They dropped off a uh, Russian research module and then went home. Shortly after they left, then we got... Uh, Oleg, TJ, and Suichi home and brought back up with them uh, wheels, sorry, Doug, Wheelog, Shannon Walker, and uh, Fyodor Yurchik, and that's them making their way to the space station and docking to that new module that the uh, STS-132 crew bought, brought up with them, and that's uh, them on their first day in the space station. And here's just a few shots of, uh, of life, namely my life on board. There's uh, Doug Wheelock getting into our uh, minus 80 degree freezer, and Shannon, they're uh, shutting the door to it. My uh, two crewmates, uh, Sasha Skortsov and Mikhail Kornienko. That's me running on a treadmill. That's just uh, me hanging out. It's our microgravity science glove box. Uh, we do some science in there. That's me uh, getting ready to do some maintenance on our carbon dioxide removal assembly. And that's what it looks like once you open the panel and get that monster out. That helps us to uh, clean the air on board the space station. 
And you're not void of chores. That's me vacuuming uh, on Saturday. Did a lot of demonstrations for, uh, for kids' experiments, uh, some neurological experiments where they tried to get inside my head and understand how it worked. Just uh, every day working on board. That's the 4th of July with my uh, two US crewmates, Shannon and Doug. And then one of the uh, <laughs> greatest moments of our life was when uh, the, um, a pump module failed on board the International Space Station. This, uh, this pump um, circulates ammonia through the lines that then cools down water that is used to uh, uh, cool down the uh, avionics on board. One of our pumps failed, and it, uh, that whole uh, period of time took on a life of its own as we went out to help uh, repair and uh, actually remove and replace. We did three spacewalks, Doug and myself with uh, Shannon at the, uh, at the controls to get the station back up and running. This is kind of my favorite part. That's the cupola, our bay window. And uh, these are just some of the awesome shots that you see out of that. Earth observations are probably the most fascinating um, part of looking out that window. That's the Bahamas. And this picture doesn't even do it justice. There are some amazing things that you see out that window, and no, no view is ever the same. That's unfortunately the Gulf oil spill. You can actually see contrails of airplanes, and the airplanes themselves, as well as the uh, wake from boats. Moons were always uh, extraordinary. And I actually thought I saw a Mount Everest out there, but the Earth, uh, the Earth Ops folks told me, nope, that's, that's not just mountains, Tracy. <laughs> we also see, saw a lot of uh, hurricanes during the period of time I was there. And I could never get enough of that horizon. It was amazing. When the sun would set, the, the glint on the, uh, on the earth was just amazing. Different opalescent colors of yellow and pink and blue. And just looking at the space station itself was, was uh, a very amazing thing. I mean, in that shot there, you see all the robotic arms that we have up there to date, all connected and, and ready to do their job. It's, um, it's a pretty exciting thing. Those of you involved in robotics, I'd really appreciate that. It's really cool just looking at the vehicle and uh, seeing the things that get docked to it. Those uh, toaster oven grids look like, uh, that was actually the solar arrays that uh, you see in that photo there, uh, reflecting off the payload bay of the shuttle. Just looking at hardware is pretty fascinating up there. The Terminator, when the sun sets and it uh, casts a dark shadow on the Earth, it's one of the most eerie things that you can see up there, but it's actually exciting. It's like a scary movie that you don't want to watch, but you do. The, the planet just disappears. It's amazing. But I love looking at that moon, and uh, you get some very, very uh, unique shots of it from up there. But again, I could never get enough of the horizon, and, and again, these pictures are, are just giving you a sample of, of what life is like. Lightning, it actually lights up the entire space station. Aurora Borealis, is, it's, it's light that dances. It's, it's just gripping. And it does glow green like that. It's amazing. When the sun sets, you know, the Earth is still a, a very uh, um, intriguing place with all of its city lights and, and the places you call home. It, it, believe it or not, the, 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 the world is mostly water because when you do actually land over, uh, fly over the land, it's uh, very rare that you see lights. Mesospheric clouds are things you only see uh, when the sun sets, and they're very hard to, uh, to take uh, photos of. All good things, I guess, come to an end, but uh, this one was quite tearful for us as we pulled away in our Soyuz capsule and then uh, kerplunked on the uh, surface of the Earth. It's a bit of a stiff landing compared to a shuttle, that's for sure. And that's us. Uh, enjoying our little furry chairs, talking to my husband on a satellite phone who was deployed it on a ship at the same time. That's my favorite pastime. And that right there is the culmination of a, of a big dream come true. Thank you, thank you. But um, honestly, uh, that life that I le led up there was uh, was not my doing. It was the uh, the doing of all of those. What was it? That number you gave, eighteen thousand civil servants. Civil servants. All those people that put this space program together. It, it, you you see the astronauts most often, but 
you get on that website and you and you listen and watch the stories of these women and you'll see you'll see what makes NASA so great. It's not just the people who fly in space, okay? But um, I'm here to give you guys a little bit of advice. Uh, you're not tired yet. You're not bored. Can I keep going? Haven't used up too much of your time yet. You got a little bit more. Okay. Well, you guys, you know what? You are the best at being you. And you're at your best when what you do makes you happy, just like my video there. So know yourself and take stock in the things that you enjoy doing. Pay attention to what fuels you. What gets your attention? What would get you out of bed early? What is it that you're doing that causes you to totally forget and not even care what time it is? What is it that you pick up that you can't put down? What are you doing when what matters to you the most is doing it right and not getting it over with? What's taking root in the back of your mind right now? And what is it that you're itching to try, but you're wondering, how in the world am I going to do it? Throughout your life, I hope you take note of these things. All that you do influences what you become. You never know what you'll be down the road and when and where those influences are going to come into play. My father was an electrician. I started going on job sites with him at a very young age. My mom needed a babysitter, so I think I was about two years old when I started to go to work with dad. When I was five, he started his own commercial electrical contracting company. And when I was uh, seven, I got my first paycheck. Back then, minimum wage was about five donuts from Winchell's. <laughs> I was 10 when I got my first tool belt. I was 15 when I w wired up my first uh, sub panel with relays. And I was 19 when my dad sent me on my first service call, alone. I worked for my father on weekends, nights, and on every school break until I was 25 years old and my father retired his company. It wasn't the most glamorous life being an electrician. Every day was a long day, getting up at 3 a.m. to beat the traffic, driving 70 to 100 miles sometimes just to get to a job site. You'd put in a hard, long day, and then you'd get back in the truck and merge with traffic to come home. When I was 16 and I started driving the work truck and picking up the guys, then I would sit into the LA traffic for 70 to 100 miles just to get to the job site. I don't know what a job site's like today, but back then, there was rarely a porta potty. And if there was, there was only one. It wasn't marked for women, and it wasn't very inviting. Most of the guys from the other trades knew who I was. I was known as JC's daughter, TC. And they knew to leave me alone and just let me work for the most part. Sometimes I got a lot more attention than I wanted or I deserved, and it wasn't always flattering, helpful, cordial, or even appropriate. I was worn out and filthy after every day on the job, and heading back to school at the end of summer, I had pale skin, weathered hands, sliced fingers, broken nails. I was, uh, had bruises all over from head to toe, and heading into class, I looked nothing like the other girls at school. Construction's a tough business. The job is tiring, the hours are long, and good workers are hard to find. I was my father's most loyal and reliable employee, and yet when the minimum wage went from donuts to cash, I was usually the last one to get paid if I got paid at all. I would have worked for my dad for free. I think all of you would too, right? It's mom and dad. You love them. My dad didn't make me work for him. He didn't make me feel guilty. My sister didn't work for him. He gave me a choice. You know what? I liked it. I liked working with tools. I discovered that I liked fixing things. I loved it when Dad came back from the supply house and he had a new tool. He'd say it was to make our life easier, but we knew it was just an excuse. He'd figure it out, and then he'd show me how to use it. We used to remodel retail stores and offices. It was the best thing ever to go in and demolish the place and then build it right back up. I loved crawling in ceilings hauling the ladders, pulling the wire, making up the J-boxes, bending the pipe, calculating the circuits, and eating the lunch that mom packed. Dad had this fantastic knack for solving problems, and whenever we got into a snag, he'd figure out a way to solve it. I watched my dad for a number of years, how he worked, how he used tools, how he approached problems. With all those years of experience and everything my father had taught me, I had achieved journeyman status as an electrician. It was rather funny that when it came time for me to begin my undergraduate research in chemistry, that the new professor on faculty actually recruited me to be in his group, not for my talents in chemistry, 
but for my simple skills in construction. I installed lights and outlets, designed circuit boards. I spent more time uh, with a wrench in my hand assembling equipment than I ever did holding a beaker and mixing chemicals, which is not at all what I pictured my life as a researcher in a chemistry lab to be like. After all that, and the lab was functional. I had a front row seat, my professor's undivided attention as he taught me everything he could with the time I had left, how lasers were used to study molecules. Since then, in every step of the way of my path of becoming an astronaut, I found myself and others benefiting from the skills I learned simply by doing something that I loved and was natural to me. I was completely clueless, though, to the impact that it would have on my life. Looking back on it, I think God was preparing me all along to live on board the International Space Station where things often break, they get lost, and they don't always work out the way that uh, they were planned. And sometimes, you're one of the only people on board that can fix it. Like I said, you never know what's down the road. There'll be a lot of great moments down the road for you, especially if you uh, take, to work, take to heart the words of advice that you hear from these women at NASA. Remember what I said about their strong character? Do you know what I mean by that? Strong character? Amidst all their hopes and their inspirations, you'll notice that these women became bold in their struggles. And it was the challenges that they had to overcome, not necessarily the victories that they won, that refined their spirit and it defined their character. Now here's what you guys are going to face as you grow up. Imagine that there's something that you want to do that's out there. But there's this wall right in front of you. There's fear, okay? There's fear that you're going to fail before you get there. There's doubt. There's doubt that you're good enough to get there. There's discouragement. That's when you hit the wall. There's obstacles. That's you figuring out the wall. There's trials. That's you overcoming the wall. There's threats to your confidence. That's falling off the wall. There's criticism. That's you being judged by others about things that are sometimes not even related to the wall. And there's failure. That's when you find a different way to pass over the wall. There's hesitation. That's you holding back from conquering the wall. And of course, there's perceptions like, well, no one else is doing it. That's you waiting for others to confirm for you that what you're doing is right, when all you need is a belief in yourself. So how do you overcome it? How do, you, how do you overcome it when you hit that wall? You do what you like, and you like what you do. That's a slogan somewhere. I think you'll find that to be the one thing that resonates inside of truly successful people. And you might have a different measure of success, but honest people have a, have a, who have experienced it have the sweet sensation, and they describe it as a sense of joy and fulfillment in their heart. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? I grew up in the deserts of Southern California riding dirt bikes. I was nine when mom and dad uh, got me my first motorcycle. It was a Honda XR80. Does anyone here ride those things? Yeah, right. You spend a lot of time in the beginning falling off of them, don't you? At least I did. Anyway, I mean, well, when you're decked out in boots and leathers and a padded shirt and you got gloves and a helmet, I mean, you're all geared up to fall, right? Well, mom, uh, mom took that as uh, medical insurance, and, and to me, all that gear just was an invitation to climb the tallest hill that I could. I felt invincible and power, powerful and, and quite mammoth on my little red bike, and I don't think I was even four feet tall back then. I'd come to what seemed to me as a massive hill, so tall that I couldn't even see anything but the sky above it. I don't know what it is about infinity for me, but just like the horizon in those pictures you saw that's bathing in the, in the ocean, or the stars when they're fixed deep in the blackness of space, I find myself captivated with my heart pounding and I'm nearly breathless as I try to reach out there with my eyes and my thoughts and touch it. Infinity, that is. I don't know. When, when I stood there, though, what was between me and that summit was nothing short of Mother Nature's bad housekeeping. There were ruts in the, in the, in the trail. There was soft sand at the base. There was uh, boulders outcropping everywhere, tight curves and deep crevices paralleling the very path I envisioned myself taking to the top. Oh yeah, and don't forget, there's that thorny bush right there at the peak. I usually couldn't tell either where the trail went at the top. For all I knew, sitting there with my engine idling, I could be headed for a cliff and have to swerve quickly to avoid falling into the abyss and taking my beloved bike with me. If mom was there, she'd be watching me like this. 
Anyway, the hills uh, were tough, and I knew it was going to take a lot of energy and focus and all the strength and attention and agility that I had to make it around those obstacles to where I wanted to go, and that was on top of that mountain. Young ladies, I hope that you'll believe me when I say this, that uh, when you find that thing in life that you want to do and that wall gets in front of you, that you're going to keep your heart at the top of that hill, okay? I want to see some heads nod. Okay. I was 27 years old when I was selected by NASA to be an astronaut, and I had just turned 28 when I showed up for my first day on the job. There I was on top of that monstrous hill I just climbed. I was an astronaut, but I wasn't at the summit yet. I came there to fly in space, and I had a long way to go still. I had my heart set on doing an EVA. I mean, after all, what's a spacewalker but a construction worker in a pressurized suit working 220 miles above the surface of the Earth doing construction, at Mach 25 in the vacuum of space. I mean, I felt like I was born to do that. Come on. To make a long story short, that pressurized suit is perhaps the hardest part about training for a spacewalk, especially for someone slender like me. It takes years of training to become qualified for an EVA, and it's not always a given that you're going to do one. Though I was so grateful for my first space flight, I'll shamefully admit that I was heartbroken when I didn't get selected to do an EVA on my first flight. I don't think I ever worked harder for anything in all my life like I did to be a spacewalker. And that's saying a lot, because I worked hard my whole life. Remember that wall I was telling you about? Well, I was told early in my career that if I got to do an EVA, I would never do a complicated, time-critical spacewalk. Certainly not one that was unplanned. You could say I was a little disappointed by that. You know, that period of my life was much like that hill I faced on my motorcycle. Ruts, crevices, and boulders and all. Who put those things there? Why couldn't I move that wall and get what I wanted? It wasn't for lack of effort or hard work. I wanted to do an EVA so badly, but I could not see a clear way to get there. It was like having your desires have a head-on collision with uncertainty. Nothing about it was in my control. Mom sent me a Bible verse. It was 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. Don't be afraid and discouraged. The battle is not yours, but God's. Does anybody here know that serenity prayer? You probably heard it. God, grant me the grace to accept with serenity the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and that precious wisdom to know the difference. In the little, book, little red book of wisdom by Mark DeMoss, he writes, when I finally learned to relinquish personal control and responsibility for everything beyond my control, the ship of my emotions entered calm waters. And my husband reminds me of a Japanese proverb that says, if you fall down seven times, you get up eight. When it came to doing a spacewalk, I realized there was nothing more I could do that I didn't already do. And the rest was in God's hands. So I waited for his timing. And by the grace of God, through a serendipitous critical failure of our external thermal control system, Loop A ammonia pump module, the first and largest failure in the onboard history of our International Space Station, taking with it half our station's power and setting us up for a bad situation if we lost our second remaining ammonia pump, a system involving the largest fluid lines and quick disconnects on station containing the most toxic substance on board. I got not only a complicated, time-critical, unplanned spacewalk that lasted over eight hours, I got three of them. So remember, some things are out of your control. That's not always a bad thing. You guys are your best at being you. And you're at your best when what you do makes you happy. Learn about yourself. Discover what motivates you. You never know what's down the road. You'll hit a few walls on the way. Just keep your heart at the top of that hill. And remember, some things are beyond your control. And that can bring about good things. Godspeed, ladies. And thank you for your attention. Tracy, thank you so much. That was truly inspirational. Really appreciate that. We do have uh, uh, some questions uh, from our audience today. And so I'd like to invite, uh, uh, let's see, we have Anna T. up to the microphone to ask a question. My name is Anna T. 
I go to Lo I'm an eighth grader at Longfellow Middle School. I'm with the Jam Doctors Robotics team, and my question is for Lori Garver. I know that you recently spoke at the International Space Conference about the importance of international cooperation. What experiences or opportunities would you recommend high school students take part in to bring together the countries of the world? Wow, Anna, that's a great question. I live in McLean, so how great that you you go to Longfellow. Um, they aspects of the space program that are international to me and, and actually the uh, photos that Tracy just showed I think reinforce this global perspective that we have from space. When people who have gone to space come back they always tell us they have a epiphany on orbit that there aren't borders between countries and going to space has allowed us to really look back and see not only the fragility of our world but how we have to work together. I would say as high schoolers you have the opportunity uh, to study other cultures. Certainly uh, there are all kinds of opportunities. I would absolutely suggest you study at least one additional language to English uh, because as you grow up and go to college and beyond to really live in another culture and understand it, I'm sure you feel that way about your time in Russia, is invaluable. Uh, all of us, the world is getting smaller as we, through space actually and satellites, connect uh, the world. Um, we have the ability, I think, to recognize we can't make decisions alone that don't affect the rest. So I would guess that all of your careers are going to be somewhat international. Uh, and so I would take the opportunity in high school to study other languages, other cultures, and really, really gain this appreciation for being a global citizen. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. We have a question from Pradyuta. My name is Pradyuta Padmanabhan from Oak Hill Elementary, fifth grade. I'm with the Capital Girls First Lego League team. My question is for Tracy Caldwell Dyson. When you travel through the Earth's atmosphere and exit its field, does it feel any different? Can you please explain how your body reacts to the lack of gravitational forces? Well, when you go through the atmosphere, um, you don't necessarily notice it when you're sitting inside the capsule or the, or the space shuttle because of all the, the forces of acceleration that you're experiencing. You can't tell really um, as on your way up when you're launching. Um, exactly what is you going through the atmosphere and how much of it is you just shooting up like a rocket <laughs> going uh, 17,500 miles per hour. So it's kind of hard to distinguish the difference. Coming home, it's a much different story, especially when you come home in a Soyuz capsule. You definitely know when you hit the atmosphere. And you know when you get through it because your parachute opens up and it's the greatest shock of your life. But uh, um, there's, there's uh, no other sensation on the way up there. And you... It's kind of different where you experience the where you first experience microgravity once you get to space because on the shuttle, um, you know, I had I was one of the first people to unstrap out of my seat because I my job was to uh, film the external tank as it fall, fell away. So everybody stayed put, um, and had I not unstrapped right away, um, the only thing I would uh, that would give me a clue that I was in microgravity would be everything else that was floating around me. Because when you're strapped in your seat, you can't really tell. And you're strapped in there pretty good. Um, but on the Soyuz, um, because, and you saw in the picture there how small it is inside there, and you're, you're in your seat very, very tightly cinched, uh, you can't really tell um, that your body's floating. And the only sensation that you have is a panel that is in front of you, and you look at it, and you have this sensation that you are upside down hanging from your straps. You know, when you're sitting in your seat right now, you can feel your bottom touching the, the chair. But when you're in space, um, you don't have that sensation anymore. And, and now you can feel the straps on your shoulder. And, and in your mind, it's like when you hook your legs around a bar and you hang upside down. You know that feeling? That is what it felt like for me inside the Soyuz uh, when I first got to, uh, to space and microgravity. So, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And a question from Anna M. My name is Anna Morris. I'm from Greenbrier West Elementary. My team name is the Robotics Chicks. My question is for Sabrina Thompson. I would like to know how you use creativity in your job as an aerospace engineer. What have you created or invented to work in space? 
Well, so far, I've only been working at NASA Goddard for about a year, and I haven't had the opportunity to, to create or invent anything as of yet. Um, right now, I work in safety, so my job consists mostly of uh, creating policies and procedures to protect the NASA scientists and engineers when they're doing their jobs. Um, so in the near future, I do see myself um, creating or inventing something that will work in space. Uh, but for the meantime, um, in my leisure, when I'm outside of work, I do a lot of outreach activities with students like you guys. And um, I just create different activities and experiments that um, you know, I actually perform with you guys. And um, I do that pretty much you know, at least a couple times a month. So that's where I'm able to use my creative side. Does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. And uh, from Samantha M. Um, my name is Samantha Mendez, and I'm from Chantilly High School. I'm a senior. I'm with Sh um, FIRST Robotics, Team 612 Chantilly Robotics, and I'm a mentor of Supercomputers and FLL team. And my question is for Lori Garvis. Um, Heyman Gr Granat once wrote that reading, writing, and arithmetic are important only if served to make our children more humane. With technology and globalization, do you believe that increasing the number of females in the field of mathematics and science will also increase the morality due to maternal instincts? <laughs> wow, that's a very interesting question. Our time is up. We're going to have to start. I've been known to use that. Um, I actually believe that women's perspective on uh, these topics is meaningful and is, is going to cause us to have uh, a different approach th than just men. That's, that's uh, what diversity is all about. I do think I bring something different to this than, than a man would, and I don't think that any, any of you uh, should, should feel differently about that. Uh, we have, I think, a responsibility. Uh, I, I am a parent, but of course I don't really believe having, uh, being a mother is that much different than being a father, but I, I do believe that we have a responsibility to the next generation and uh, that we take an interest uh, and a responsibility for that in, in a differentiated way as women. We have, uh, I think I mentioned a little bit about this need to have more women engineers specifically. Women tend to, now we're all already, uh, as, as we talked a little bit about, have a higher percentage of women than men graduating from college, a higher percentage of women than men lawyers, and doctors, but not engineers. And I can't help but think that one of the reasons is uh, because we are not taught early on that engineers actually are very, very much committed to and responsible for making the world a better place. And that's what a lot of us want to do. And so uh, <laughs> as people, I think, recognize better the contributions that engineers and STEM careers more broadly uh, contribute to a better future, to uh, uh, humanity's uh, advancement, I think we will have more women and that will be a good thing. Thank you. And we're going to take one last question. This is from Sarvajna. My name is Sarvajna K from Greenbrier West ES, sixth grade, and I am with the Robotics Chicks FLL team, and my question is for Tracy Caldwell Dyson. Um, what was the most important thing you learned on your trip? Oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, that's a hard one to answer, you know. Um, there's a lot of important things that uh, that you learn, especially well every day, right? I mean, you don't have to just go to space for that, but um, but when you go to space, it presents a unique opportunity to learn <laughs> important things. Um, just like uh, Lori mentioned, you know, astronauts come back and they uh, have uh, somewhat of a, a revelation about looking down at the Earth and and just how um, gosh, it's so many things. It's fragile. It's plump, it's blue, it's yellow, it's pink, it's green, it's it's amazing, and um, you 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 don't see the borders that you hear about here and you fight for down here, um, and you you feel very protective of it up there, 
And that's one reason why you want to bring everybody up there and stick their nose in that cupola window and let them see what you're seeing. Because if they did, even the person that cares the least about our environment would change their mind, I'm, I'm pretty convinced. When you see that earth through your eyes, your very own eyes, you're in disbelief. You cannot believe that you are up there looking at that thing. You can't believe what you're seeing. And it's going by fast. You better be paying attention. We're going Mach 25, folks. And that earth doesn't stand still. And um, a, lot, a lot of times you go over parts of the earth where there's um, clouds, and you can't really see the earth below. Um, but then when, when the clouds part and you see this incredible uh, landmass features, you saw some of the photos today of some of those that caught our eye. And then you see Mother Nature at her finest with the, with the uh, storms, the, the, the hurricanes, the, that you could see for, for thousands of miles. You can see for thousands of miles up there. You can see the curvature of the earth. You can see, you can see lightning. And you can see lightning spread all across the planet. All across, I mean, you would not believe standing here on the surface of the earth just how far lightning can go. It's amazing that, 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 that people in different parts of the world are experiencing the same storm system. And I've watched it up in space. You can see the, the, when the sun sets, you can watch all the stars come out. You can watch the moon set. And when the moon sets, but behind the atmosphere and you saw a picture of it, it distorts the view of it. And there was once I looked out the window and I thought, I thought there was a branding iron that had landed on the earth and it was actually the moon with the way that the sun was setting on it that it turned red and orange and it was distorted and it was the way it was spread out across uh, what looked like the earth, but it was actually being distorted through the atmosphere and my view through it. And then when the sun sets and you look at uh, the stars and you, you look at the stars up from where we are here, right? And you look through the atmosphere and you see things twinkling, but you don't see them twinkle up in space because you're above the atmosphere. And the other thing you see when you're down here looking up at the stars, and it doesn't matter if you're Yosemite away from all of the lights and, and uh, light pollution, you see so many stars that you can't even make out a constellation that you're so used to seeing. It's the same thing in space, but here, on the bottom, on, on, the, on the earth, you look and you see, you see all the stars look like they're in the same plane. But when you're above the atmosphere, you actually see depth in stars. You see stars that are further away than they are cl as close to you. And that's the most amazing thing. And if I had to say the most important thing I learned up there was that when I think about how many people get to see what I'm seeing, how much more important it is that we get more people to see that very thing. Because you realize just how small you are when you're above the earth that far and you see so much of it and you know how many people there are on that planet that need to come up and take a look at that same thing you're looking at. So the most important thing I learned was how small I was and how important it is we get more people up there to see it. Thank you all. Please uh, give one more round of applause to our wonderful panelists, Sabrina Thompson, Tracy Cobble Dyson, and Lori Garber. Thank you all for coming today to share a Women's History Month event with us. And uh, go science, go engineering, go math. Uh, thank you again, and thank you to all who put this wonderful event together. <laughs>